Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the studio for a beginner's guide to mold making using silicone and plaster. We will be making our silicone and plaster mold over the half life size figure we made in our half life size tutorial series over on Patreon. What you'll learn here is the basics of mold making using these materials, plaster and silicone. Of course, that includes material consideration, but also how to solve the puzzle that is a mold so that we can easily open our mold and cast in it later. We have the raw clay sitting out and ready to be covered in silicone. We do let the clay sit for a few minutes perhaps, if necessary, to allow it to dry, to be dry to the touch, so that making fingerprints and nail marks in the clay is much less of a concern. But first things first, let's talk about the materials we will be using during this first step. You are going to have to collect some materials if you are to follow along with the techniques that I'll be using during this tutorial series. Most will be simple and easy to get, and I'll lay out options and variation on those materials you might find hard to come by. Disposable gloves are really useful, as the materials we will be working with are not truly, completely health-friendly, let's say. They're not super dangerous, but it's probably good to use gloves. In general, it's only going to be the silicone that we would want to keep our hands free from. Later, when we work with plaster, this is not really a concern. Though plaster does dry your hands out, and some people find that annoying. A container for water is needed as well, as you'll see later. Use a disposable one, or one dedicated to this cause. Some sort of wooden clay modeling tool that you can use to manipulate silicone in tight corners, nooks and crannies, where we can't fit our fingers, is going to be useful as well. And then finally, of course, the silicone. I'll be using a paste-based silicone called Blue Sil RTV 3325P, and the P stands for paste. There are more widely available options out there that you can use as well. If you live in America, you can order a silk palm from Complete Sculptor in New York City. They ship nationwide, I believe. You can also use a product from Smooth On called Poyo Putty. Smooth On is fairly easily available all over the world. And I'll leave links to all of these products in the description below the video and to my FAQ post on Patreon with all my materials in it and links there as well. Lucille RTV 3325P and all the alternatives listed are tin-based silicones, which for us simply means that they'll set up and cure against pretty much any surface, no sealer needed. They are flexible when it comes to how much catalyzer you put in, and are in general more forgiving and easy to work with compared to platinum-based silicones, which is the other option. However, they don't last as long, but these molds will last us decades, so we have nothing to really worry too much about in the, uh, in the longevity department, let's say, using tin-based silicones. If you are interested in more differences between platinum and tin-based silicones, you can look that up on Google yourself. There's plenty of information out there. Mixing RTV 3325P is straightforward. Take some catalyzer and apply it to the silicone. Then mix the two together until there are no streaks of color present. Because the silicone is tin-based and very forgiving on the amount of catalyzer applied, I can simply mix by eye. I'm looking for the color of the silicone to be essentially correct. A pale lemon yellow with a hint of green is around the color that we're looking for. Now the color changes when it sets up by the way, so it turns more yellow as it sets. Each bucket of 3325P comes with five tubes of catalyzer. One bucket is five kilos, so essentially, if we were to mix by ratio, we would have one kilo of silicone per tube of catalyzer. I rarely mix this much at one time, however, as it is too much for one man to apply before the silicone sets up, leading to wasted material and wasted money, of course. In this video, you'll see me working without gloves. Now, this is not recommended. The catalyzer is not very good for you, so I recommend using gloves at all times. At least mix the silicone with gloves on, if you just can't stand wearing gloves. Remember to use a lot of water on your hands to keep the silicone from sticking. You can also use sunflower seed oil on your gloves if you find the silicone sticks to them a lot. However, I am a little bit nervous about this practice because of delamination, so I don't use any sort of oils. To be clear, I don't wear gloves because I don't make that many molds and because I find the silicone sticks to them too much, making it too hard to work. 
Now I will take my own tip here and start using gloves in the future when I mix the silicone at least. I do believe that this is very good practice. A very good practice to get into. Even when working with mixed silicone, some catalyzer will still get on your hands. It's not completely bound inside the mixed silicone. So be warned and play it safe here. Every place that sells any material should be able to provide you with a technical data sheet. These papers will have all the information on how to use the material, information on, on the material, like shore hardness, for example, for silicone, and they will also have safety information and recommended practices. I suggest you always get a hold of the technical data sheet for a new material you are using so you can use it safely and according to the manufacturer's specifications. With silicone mixed, we are ready to begin applying silicone to the surface of our sculpture. This process is going to be pretty straightforward for the most part, with some tips and tricks you should know about so that you can get the best possible mold to make the most accurate castings for your work, which is what I'll share with you right here and now. First, we need to talk about technique. I apply the silicone using my fingers, always with a bit of water on them so the silicone doesn't stick. I put a blob of silicone down and squeeze it outwards from where I had applied it. I'm always going to be squeezing outwards towards the edges as this will help keep the thickness of the layer even and any air bubbles trapped inside the silicone will be pushed towards the edge and hopefully burst. Every old piece of silicone gets overlapped by the new piece of silicone that I apply. I always apply over the top of where silicone is already applied and push outwards from there. This helps deal with bubbles as well and makes sure there are no weird seams or any lines on the inside surface of my silicone. Some of these might end up being visible in the finished casting. So we want to be careful about that. In broad areas, the application can be fairly fast. The size of the piece of silicone you apply is up to you, but do not make it too big as you'll have a hard time pushing the silicone thin enough for this first layer. The thickness I'm after is down to the layer that I'm working on. So for this first layer, I'm looking for a thickness that's so thin that it's almost translucent in some areas. We can see the color of the clay through the silicone. This means a silicone that is right around a millimeter or two thick, so it's pretty thin. I want my first layer this thin because thin layers have less chance of capturing air bubbles. Air bubbles matter a lot in this very first layer, of course, as it is the layer of silicone that will eventually, the inside of it will eventually become the surface of my casting. Our application in later layers will change because of this requirement changing. 